Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's webcast. We're excited to have you join us. Quick housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is recorded and we'll share the recording over email to everyone who registered. We'll save questions for the end of the webcast, but please feel free to type in the Q&A whenever you have one. It's located to the left of your webcast console and can be hidden or pulled up using the button at the bottom. Okay, let's get started on today's webcast. My name is Emily. I'm a content marketer at HitLab, and joining me today is Allison, our UX team lead, and Sarah, our UX researcher. I'll start with a quick introduction of GitLab, then Allison will explain how the UX team makes design decisions and prioritizes the many different streams of feedback they receive. Sarah will chat about our UX research efforts and share how you can help. Finally, we'll close the session with a Q&A or we'll be joined by additional UX team members who can answer all of your questions. GitLab is the integrated platform for the full software development lifecycle. It's built on top of Git, the leading version control system. Git allows developers to store a local copy of their source code, propose changes to it, and share those changes with others. We help you create great software by strengthening and integrating your source code management, code review, testing tools, and deployment process in one platform. A unified experience across the development lifecycle helps increase developer productivity by reducing the number of times your developers have to switch from one platform to the next. This ensures everyone on your team is more productive and more collaborative, providing the most efficient approach to software delivery. The UX team is integral to the product by designing the interface, responding to feedback, and helping fit new features into our understanding of the needs of all users, ensuring that all members of your team, technical or not, can communicate and collaborate. Because of the expansive nature of our product, our UX team routinely tackles a series of unique creative challenges. While most other developer tools only focus on one aspect of the life cycle, our UX team has worked to piece together all the tools we ship with GitLab in one package. If that weren't enough, this is the jigsaw that the UX team re-navigates for our release on the 22nd of every single month. Finally, they have to design for all technical levels and ensure that the product remains user-friendly for everyone from developers and PMs, admins and managers. Even our marketing team uses GitLab to create materials like this. We understand how important UX is for the adoption of new software, and we want to make it as easy as possible for your team to start using GitLab right away. As your needs change while you're using GitLab, our UX team has their ear to the ground for each monthly release and is eager to hear about your use case. For more on how they work, I'll hand it off to Allison, our UX team lead. Thanks so much, Emily. Uh, hi, everyone. So, to get started, I wanted to chat a little bit about uh, how we make design decisions here at GitLab. And so at every stage, we have to carefully think through why decisions are made and for whom we're making all these decisions for. Uh, we do have a number of methods that help us do this. You know, all kinds of research and testing and surveys. We also work really closely with our internal developers, as well as carrying on a constant conversation with our wonderful community. One of our major challenges, as uh, a lot of UX people might feel, is decoding what people say by finding what they might actually mean and why. Verbal feedback is super helpful, but sometimes it can be better for us to really watch user behavior or watch how they've set up their repos and projects. And so our research will really help us see where the objective challenges are. We work hard to dig beyond the surface level feedback. A lot of people have easy design fixes to propose. But when we look at these, we need to think about the impact of every single change on all our various user groups. And also how these changes impact our larger goals or visions for the product. Easy design fixes sometimes are just kind of solving the symptom of the deeper problem. And so it can be very helpful for us to watch and ask questions and listen 
to make sure we actually understand the real problem that is coming to light. And so this can often lead to a win-win situation, as it can help us create even better solutions than originally proposed, proposed, and it aligns better with our larger design system and principle, principles. And so in addition to all of this, we work with nearly every team at the company of GitLab and carefully triage all the issues and requests that come in. We incorporate the perspectives of our management team, support team, sales, and internal developers. And we do this every single month for our release on the 22nd. One of the things that makes us pretty unique is that we use our product day in, day out uh, for our job. A UX designer or researcher who works in e-commerce, for example, might very well shop online regularly. But it's unlikely that they only shop in the store that they designed or that they spend their entire day in their own product. And so this gives us a very intimate understanding of how the software is used. It does empower us to also become users with opinions, but it forces us to be extra thoughtful about removing our own bias from our evaluation of the UX. We take it very seriously that we need to represent all opinions and not just our own. UX is about the calculated decisions and the logical analysis, not just anyone's idea about like, what they like best. So we naturally adopt a sort of split brain uh, approach when using the software and observing user behavior. We have to empathize both as users and as technical experts. We also work very closely with engineering and product. Being a remote startup, one of our rather unique challenges is building a shared vision and perspective for our user experience while we are scattered across the globe and across all the features of the product. We're working hard on this by documenting everything that we can in our UX guide, which you're, which, uh, you're free to read through and let us know what we're missing. <laughs> but uh, more and more of the industry is becoming remote. And so we're excited to be experimenting with different ways to stay connected and to work through these kinds of problems together. And we believe what we can learn uh, by doing this will uh, be increasingly valuable to other companies. So we navigate our relationship with the product team by understanding that they are both users and builders too. We also have to translate their feedback and their ideas uh, for features using the same methods we use for ourselves and outside users. We're all part of the same conversation just as developers, but we need to bring in the different birth and perspectives to represent. Our center challenge is very common and well-known to all those in the UX field, and it's building something uh, that satisfies and works for all kinds of people. So at GitLab, this means bringing something that's inherently technical in functionality that was originally uh, designed for developers to a place where it works well for product managers and marketers and everyone who needs to use it. So one of the recent examples uh, of this is around this feature of resolvable discussions. So this feature comes from a uh, merge request uh, and it allows people to have active conversations about a piece of code with a back and forth until they come to an agreement. However, we realized that we could pull all this functionality outside of the realm of, of code. When you edit plain text or even when you're having a conversation, there are particular moments when you have to push for an agreement. So moving this kind of functionality beyond code brings more value to more people, you know, such as people working in marketing or, or legal and makes everyone more productive. So in this way, we can help influence decisions about which features to work on next. So in general, we do a lot of listening, watching, and learning about how the project is working and how people want to use it. We also have to be very uh, sensitive to all the different ways of working. We always need to balance uh, all these different perspectives, the enterprise needs, the community needs, and our own values as a company. We're definitely opinionated, and we have our GitLab workflow, which we use at GitLab, the company. But we do understand that not everyone works the way we do. Some of our company's values, for example, extreme transparency, need to be made optional for users in other companies. For example, when we think about how permissioning should work 
things that we care about or don't care about is very different than other people care about. And so in addition to this, we also build things that we ourselves don't currently need. It's true that GitLab has grown quite a bit in the last year, and we now have 40 plus developers. But we know there are teams out there with hundreds to thousands of developers working towards a common goal, and we want to build GitLab to support them. And so there are many features that are geared towards helping manage these larger teams trying to triage huge amounts of work. These are features such as merge request approvals, uh, waiting of issues, time tracking, that we as a team and the company have no need of. And so it, we find it very important to, for us to keep building out these features, though, um, to fill out our idea to production vision and help large companies map their process to the GitLab workflow. Last, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we balance uh, feedback. So as I mentioned, we listen a lot. And we make sure to keep a, a steady communication with a lot of people. Um, and so we get a lot of feedback. Uh, and in order to keep up with all these, you know, monthly releases and figure out what to deliver in terms of the minimal changes, we need to prioritize and amplify some voices. So we address issues in a particular order. First and foremost, we really care a lot about our enterprise customers. Our support team is super, super vital to helping us understand what our customers need, how they're using the product, what challenges they're running into. The outside community uh, is next in, in terms of who we love listening to. Um, we love seeing how people work differently with a product, uh, and that really kind of pulls us out of our bubble of our own work style and process. And finally, we love working with the developers on our team. They know the product inside and out. They're opinionated, passionate, and wonderful to work with. So we're constantly balancing all this feedback as it comes in. And now I'm going to pass this off to Sarah. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah, GitLab's first UX researcher. So what do we want to learn at GitLab, and how are we learning it? Well, we build an understanding of who our users are and how they work. We get a lot of great feedback from the community that is really useful, but we want to make sure that we are capturing the voices of all our target users. We're developing personas that will allow us to relate to different types of users and subsequently predict their behavior. This is essential for our key challenge of creating a unified experience for teams big and small so that they can stay focused on their goals. You can learn a bit more about this in my recent blog post for GitLab. The survey, which you should all take, is designed to understand the similarities and differences between how users use GitLab, dependent on their organization size and role. It will also help us to confirm or disprove a couple of theories I have, such as whether using GitLab initially for hobby projects increases the likelihood of using GitLab for work-related products at a later date. I'm also really interested in hearing from people who don't use GitLab or even Git, so can understand why you may prefer using a different form of source control or perhaps the challenges you are facing in convincing your organization to move to Git. What will this help the company decide on in the future? Well, it will help us to make sure our UX goals and vision align to what our users need. It will help us decide on both the large directions and small details that confirm them using the experience and functionality in the right direction. We believe the results can be valuable across the company. UX works very closely with the front end and back end teams to build GitLab. So helping them understand our users will help us work as a team towards a shared goal. The products and marketing for the products should also feel related. Whilst who we are selling GitLab to may differ from who is using the product daily, we have to understand both to build a compelling product that people want. UX research can bring a particular set of insights about our users and customers that can help across products, marketing, support, and sales. We'd absolutely love for you to help us out and take the survey. As a thank you for your feedback, once you've completed the survey, you can enter your email address to have a chance at winning a $200 Amazon gift card. If you're interested, there are also opportunities to participate in future research. 
Simply leave your email address unprompted during the survey, or you can drop me a line directly at sarahgatelove.com. We can now move on to any questions you may have. Hi everyone, this is Dimitri Usa, one of the UX designers at GitLab. Um, we'd love to get your questions. We're currently getting them in, so we're trying to process them on which answer. Um, if you have any particular questions on certain areas in the uh, interface or on the application, we'd love to hear them. Um, Coop with us for a second while we try to see which questions are interesting for everybody to hear. Uh, we'd love to have you. Sarah, maybe uh, you can talk a little bit about uh, how many design, uh, how many pers about the process you're going with personas, and uh, how many personas uh, do you have to design for? Is one of the questions that is coming in. Yeah, great question. And um, we don't actually know the number of our personas that we have at the moment because we're still in discovery phase. Um, in terms of like kind of discovering our personas, um, we've obviously got the survey. Um, we're also using um, some user testing with users. Um, so these are people who perhaps um, give us very detailed answers in the survey who we'd like to follow up with. Um, so we can dig more into the kind of frustrations that we have with GitLab or how we're using it. Um, we're also using web analytics where possible um, to support um, the formation of the personas. In terms of deciding what questions um, we'd like to ask, to be honest, it's been a bit of a, a blank slate because we don't actually have much user research on our kind of users at the moment. Um, so it's finding out kind of what frustrates them, the very kind of basic stuff. How, how are they using it? What's frustrating them? What can be improved? How can we help them out? Um, it's good for us to understand that if you're perhaps not even using GitLab, that why why are you not using it? What is it about GitLab that you don't like? Or perhaps you're using a competitor product on what do you prefer about that? Um, so there's quite a, a number of questions on there for different types of people to try and discover the kind of wealth of our users and also those people who may be potential users as well. Cool. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, another question that's coming in is, uh, does our UX team use the GitLab's merge request workflow uh, for collaboration on all binary assets? So the way that our UX team works, uh, we work very heavily in uh, issues and having conversations as issues come up, showing explorations and iterations and, and you know, exploring, uh, exploring what, you know, solutions make sense to the problem brought up in, in the issue. You know, once we kind of have landed on direction, then that gets uh, that gets you know pushed to to code and merge across, and we're a part of the process in terms of, of uh, reviewing the changes that happen. But we don't necessarily we don't really use the merge request workflow for our binary assets. We do have the GitLab design repository, and that's where we share all of our working files, and, and as we collaborate and work together. Um, but that's more just a shared file uh, repository. Um, so I think the main uh, big answer I'd say would be no, we don't <laughs> use the merge request workflow for collaboration on our binary assets. Um, but we are a part of the whole flow as we build the features. Um, if I can opt in in that answering the question, um, maybe interesting for people to know 
um, on how we use Git to um, enhance our uh, our GitLab design repository. Um, as for example, uh, we we use Sketch preferably to to use our or create our design assets. And one of the uh, options you can have is uh, by using an incredible uh, plugin for Sketch called Sketch Measure. Um, and it, what it exactly does is it exports your design uh, specs into a um, it, you can put it online and, and your developers can see into it and get exact measurements from uh, from your design files. Um, and how we did it in Git, uh, we make use of the uh, PCI and uh, CD features from, from GitLab, um, which is really nice to, to look into it. And we automatically uh, host those spec export files, which is basically a, a website, and host them up if you give them a certain file uh, naming convention uh, in order for uh, to produce a URL to give to your developers in order for them to see your design spec. Uh, it's a, it's an, a, a partly automatic process that enhances our uh, GitLab design repo. Just just to inform you on that, Alison, back over to you. <laughs> Thanks. No, that's perfect, uh, Dimitri. Uh, so a question just came in about how uh, do we decide how to design for mobile versus desktop clients and what ways the user will interact uh, with it. And so and this is definitely something we, we, we have had conversations about. First and foremost, we uh, with, with a lot of what we build, we do focus a lot on desktop. Um, experiences. This is just kind of to map how uh, our customers and, and everyone is using it today. It's very much, a you know, when you're coding and sitting down and, and really deep in work, a lot of it happens on desktop. But there are definitely things that are very important on mobile, and we do very much care about mobile experiences. It's just finding the right uh, features that make sense more on mobile to kind of optimize for. And so a lot of you know, understanding the status or monitoring progress or a quick response, you know, to questions, issues, uh, discussions that come up. Those kinds of experiences um, we think are very valuable on mobile, and we want to continue to kind of improve and build upon them as much as we can. So we definitely don't want to ignore mobile, um, but we need to find the right balance because there's definitely things that you're not, I don't think you're going to do very commonly on mobile. Um, and and if we can optimize the mobile experience for what matters, uh, then that can feel very, you know, quick, awesome, and, and amazing on mobile. And desktop can be, uh, you know, feel focused for what desktop is good at. So, you know, it's kind of balancing some of these conversations um, when it comes to mobile. And we do track uh, how uh, for um, GitLab.com, we, we understand people who, like, how many um, – mobile users and how many desktop users do come to GitLab.com. And so it helps us understand, um, you know, kind of what pages might be more used uh, on mobile or desktop. And another question that is coming in is, what has been the biggest challenge for the UX team when building this platform? And I think, <laughs> see, there's, there's uh, the good question. There's a lot going on. I think part of it is uh, being able to keep up and with the, the awesome speed, you know, adding all the features we want. Um, at the speed that we can, addressing all this wide variety of feedback we're coming in, you know, what features are we building that's, you know, great and focused for our enterprise customers and what will be super helpful for the, uh, for, you know, our awesome community and what is good for us as a team. And so it's balancing all this that's coming in and building, you know, what is the right thing at that moment? How do we prioritize all this that's coming in and keeping up with the speed that we want to keep up with? Uh, in terms of getting features out there and pushing features out there. And so there's a lot of, you know, let's try this, let's try that. Um, sometimes we try something and it doesn't work out well, and since we iterate so quickly, we can, you know, pull back and, and, and rethink the design. Um, so it's really just kind of managing all this feedback that is coming in um, and figuring out the right direction to push from there.
Yeah, I think it's part of the design direction that GitLab chose that, or the philosophy is in that uh, feedback after having it in uh, is, is much more accurate than uh, presumptions you make as GitLab, as a designer or as uh, someone who designs uh, any any uh, function that is inside GitLab. Um, you can only trust so much into your intuition and knowledge. And if you implement it and see that, for example, you implemented 20 features and uh, two of them are apparently not what they should be, then you roll them back and you add, uh, implemented 18 instead of just, for example, less if they're not perfect. Um, I think it's, it's part of the, the philosophy of getting ahead further and faster, implementing it, reverting, and getting on. Um, I see there is a question on uh, the navigation uh, of the of the of GitLab. It's a top navigation. I think it's an important uh, aspect of the GitLab interface. Um, perhaps, uh, Alison, could you uh, give a bit of insight in what is planned ahead of us? Uh, because it is, of course, a thing that. Thanks, Riti. Yeah, it's uh, it's something we get a lot of feedback of that and we're very aware of and um, we're trying to kind of think through the right way to, um, to stop and approach it. Um, we understand the current uh, pain right now uh, with, you know, the, the two levels of, of navigation and the feeling of, of um, having to kind of, you know, feeling that, it, you know, you have to click and then click, it kind of feels, uh, it could feel slow. Um, so we've gotten a lot of that feedback and are thinking through the right ways to address that. We need to balance it with, um, if we, we need to balance. Uh, so GitLab has, <laughs> there's a lot to go. There's a lot of pages, a lot of uh, features, a lot of, you know, a lot going on. And so like the information architecture and navigation is very important for us to kind of structure and make sense. It makes sure that the flows and, and the uh, steps you go through through the various pages of GitLab makes sense and that we group the right elements together. And so, um, so that's constantly, you know, something we talk a lot about and it's constantly evolving. So we are looking at that. Um, and so that's one aspect of what we're thinking about navigation is just making sure that our layout of pages makes sense. The other uh, question that continues to kind of come up is some of the details of the interaction and micro, you know, micro interactions of, of how you interact with the navigation. Um, some of the feelings is just, you know, how it might feel slow potentially on GitLab.com. And so there's, there's work elements on that. Um, there's always a balance of, you know, we've looked at different ways to, to show the secondary levels of navigation without, um, without overcomplicating the interface. And we do plan to improve it. Uh, so. Stay tuned, we will have some improvements on that. Um, but it's just, you know, making sure we're moving things in the right direction and, and um, we're thoughtful with navigation because it's something where if we change it, we want to make sure we change it to the right direction. It can be very disruptive and, um, you know, if we change it too much, it can be very uh, uh, confusing. And so we want to make sure we kind of move it in the right direction. And so we're working on that. Um, and finding ways to simplify it, both for people who aren't very technical and are um, using different sections of the UI versus people who are deeply, you know, technical and finding the right balance there. Um, there's also the question about the icon overflow on the right, mid, and top. I think that's maybe referencing the settings icon, which we are uh, uh, actively working on um, incorporating with the rest of navigation. So we're, we're making improvements and, and uh, hope to keep improving and uh, feel free. There's plenty of uh, discussion on it on GitLab.com. So any feedback and ideas, we'd love to hear on that. And just, and just to add to um, what Alison was saying, the, the second part of that question says, how do you approach investigating your menu effectiveness? Well, I think one of the ways in which we do this, we'd actually strip the design away from it and concentrate on the information architecture first. And we do this using card sorts. So we'd ask people to group the content together, which they feel is most related to one another. And we would also then follow that up with tree testing. So this is, allows us to test the information architecture without a the design there to kind of lead users 
um, and they would click through um, what is essentially called a tree. It's like um, a hierarchy of pages, and they click through these pages to then try and find that information, highlighting when they think they found it. Once we've got a strong information architecture, we can then re-implement the design into this information architecture, and this may mean that with these small tweaks and the design still may influence information architecture, but we would go through rounds of testing with users, asking them to find certain information, ensuring that we don't directly ask um, the use the wording that is in the navigation to ensure that they understand that the content that they're looking at is what they're looking for. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Sarah, so there's a question about what um, is our process for designing new features? Um, what, you know, uh, when, do, when do we sketch ideas on paper and then present the mock-ups, the users get feedback, or, you know, how do we ask uh, users for requirements? Uh, you know, how many kind of round trips are there to users on idea to shipping of uh, features? And first and foremost, this is a constantly evolving process. We're still, you know, figuring out uh, some of the best ways of working and still kind of figure out uh, the right, you know, users and, and, and people to talk to as we're forming our personas. Um, so another shout out to survey is part of what's going to really help us understand um, who are, you know, who our users are and, and help us figure out um, who to reach out to. So another shout out to, to fill that out. But um, in terms of what our process is, it really varies. Um, you know, a lot of it is, in the issues on gitlab.com and there's just a lot of conversations uh you know people will post feedback you know uh, users and customers will post feedback as issues and then we'll think through it and kind of explore or ask questions and so there's a there's an ongoing conversation with people there um i think uh yeah it's kind of hard to answer if there's you know an explicit number of round trips to users from ideas to shipping Something we want to get better at um, continuing to uh, show earlier rougher ideas uh, to users to get feedback faster. Um, but today we also ship so fast that we'll push something out there and get feedback of, hey, this isn't working. And so that's, you know, even though we've pushed it out live, we're more than uh, happy to kind of rethink and how we might need to uh, improve upon it. Um, I don't know if uh, there's any other uh, Sarah, if you had anything else to add to to that question? No, I think you pretty much covered it, Alison. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, um, I just saw an, uh, an interesting question about uh, it, it was related to this and how we approach or re reach our goals in, in designing um, as we are dog feeding our own application. Uh, actively using it ourselves, uh, basically. And um, I think there are a lot of examples of, of this um, as our own developers use this, but uh, we ourselves um, uh, make, make a lot of, lot of the, for example, our uh, design discussion uh, goes on in uh, the issue, the issue, issue discussions. And um, of course you become, if, if, you, if you get into the discussions and you use it, you will, you will reach pain points or things that uh, you, you think will work differently if, you, if they were designed otherwise. And um, I mean, there, there have been many discussions uh, on, on, for example, uh, the merge request widget is, is a really example, uh, or shining example of what we want to, um, to build out into a better product and um, a better uh, UI feature. And uh, it's, uh, um, it's a thing that, that is used by almost anyone who uh, puts in a merge request. It, it gives the status of either the pipeline or if, if you want to merge it. And uh, there's been uh, there's been some some clear feedback and, and discussion going on on this. And um, we hope to uh, improve this in one of the uh, upcoming releases. Um, perhaps Alison or, or Sarah, perhaps you know of another good uh, example of, of a past feature that has been introduced by us bus by dog feeding our own application. Uh, 
I mean, that's a, the merge request widget is a great example, I think, of that. Um, I mean, a lot of, like, I think details come in, too, of, like, you know, we, if we, you know, go through a flow um, every day, you know, figuring out what's the right detail or step that we can um, improve upon without, you know, find, find the right balance of being opinionated with, you know, the workflow that makes sense while being flexible enough for, you know, the product to work across all kinds of teams and companies and, and ways of working. Um, so it's just finding that right balance there. Um, you know, uh, for instance, one of the things is everyone, like, like you know, a big part, right, is tracking, um, you know, managing work. Like, there's all these issues. How do you even start to triage or figure out, you know, and different people use labels differently or, or weighting differently or due dates differently. Um, and so figuring out, you know, everyone has their thing that they really, you know, their system that works for them, works for their company, how do you like triage and find the issues um, and prioritize them. And so uh, that's something where I think it's continuing to kind of evolve and it's interesting to learn how different people do it. So there's also this question that came up um, about are there any plans to display due dates on the issues in the issue board view? And, you know, it's a good question. It's, it's, there's been conversation about it. Um, there's this balance we have because, you know, some people want due dates on the issue board view. Some people want weights on the issue uh, board view. Some people want the task list there. And, you know, and I could keep going of all the things that people are like, oh, no, this is the one thing that, you know, w would help. And so it's finding the right balance because the issue board view can only show so much. <laughs> um, and so what is what is that view focused for? What is it great at? What level of detailed information is important there? Um, and then, uh, and so, you know, there, there's that balance of, okay, what opinion do we have of what makes sense for this feature? And then what level of flexibility? Because you don't want to, you know, there's obviously we could, you know, customize everything, but that starts to get overwhelming. And so, yes, we've had conversations. We're continuing kind of conversations of what makes sense for the board view, what information makes sense to help people make decisions. Um, right now, we're still kind of keeping, thinking about keeping it at the top level of kind of these are issues. Um, like top level in terms of scope and priority of the issues, but it's something that there's ongoing conversation about. Uh, yeah, just just to add to that, um, I, uh, while Elson was talking, a, a shining example uh, came up into my mind, which actually just been released, uh, or uh, you can you can watch it live at gitlab.com, uh, which is the issue list search and uh, filtering functionality. It has been recently been upgraded to uh, use a sort of Uni search box, uh, and and that is that has been done because the old search functionality wasn't flexible enough. Uh, it used too much space, uh, both vertically as well as horizontally, uh, as it could be extended with more and more features. Um, and and I think this is a really good first step in uh, making it extendable uh, for the future and um, also more user friendly in the process. Um, I think a follow-up question to this is really a really good one. Um, as our developers use our platform, uh, do you involve them early in the UX process? Uh, and, and do they uh, actively discuss uh, the process uh, and planning of, of new feature? And, and yes, um, uh, this, is, this is the main point of, um, of our workflow in designing new features. I mean, UX, UX people know a lot, but not everything, and the developers have their own sight on how things should be or uh, will be implemented if it costs much time. And also a good, a good thing to think about is how it will impact back-end design. Um, for example, a feature uh, UX design people can, can think of or invent or design, it will perhaps be a little thing, but uh, for example, for uh, someone on the back-end, it will will uh, create an in, impossible thing to, to, uh, to do. Uh, and it will uh, be a, a really big effort. Um, I think of an example in this, this effort would be um, we thought about creating a real-time uh, markdown preview next to the comment, uh, comment editor. And um, this, this, this is an awesome feature, and it, it would be really great to have this in. And we, uh, we, are look, we have looked at this, this feature for a long time, and it was, um, uh, it was actually, in the end, for now, it, we have to, get, to hold back on it because 
it involves a lot of backend uh, changes to be to be made in order to be, to be able to make it a thing that could be done. Um, and uh, we have to be careful not to um, create features that will impact performance too much, for example. And there are lots of other examples that uh, that are uh, a good example. I mean, sometimes you've got a simple thing to implement and it's really hard, and sometimes you don't. Thanks, Dimitri. Um, just kind of looking through some more of the questions that came in. Um, so there's a question kind of how many mobile device platforms do we test with and what does our mobile development testing look like? Um, I believe right now is a little bit, um, a little bit ad hoc and part of it is kind of, you know, what we see that kind of comes in, you know, we get a lot of, you know, <laughs> part of it is our community is awesome at finding, um, uh, things that we miss and we try to, you know, do our best to, to catch things. Um, you know, we're trying to get better at this. We're trying to find ways where we can um, make sure we're viewing our, you know, there's tools out there to let us view our experience on all kinds of, you know, devices and, and off. We're working on kind of uh, building that up a bit more. Um, so, yeah, right now I think it's a little uh, ad hoc, but it's uh, something we're constantly working on improving. And um, we're also very uh, receptive to any feedback we hear about it uh, in, in uh, on our issues. So. There's a question about uh, what tools we use for our analytics. Um, we actually use database monitoring on GitLab.com, but we're in a bit of a unique situation in, in the fact that most um, in installations of GitLab are on-premise, so we don't use tools like Google Analytics and things like that. Um, in addition to that, we also feel being a kind of open source community and very honest and transparent that we don't want to um, track everything that people are doing. Uh, we don't want them to feel like we're being big brother, I suppose. At the same time, we still need to get a balance of user feedback. So there is definitely more of an emphasis, more on like qualitative research, so user testing and surveys and things um, to give us insight. I hope that answers your question. Um, perhaps as an addition to that, I think um, at least it's not my my particular set of knowledge, but I think we're actively uh, looking into um, possibilities of using Prometheus into getting more statistics and analytics in everything uh, from the application, um, both inside as well as performance. Um, I see here a question about if the UX team is actively engaged in uh, designing of the API and command line uh, side of things on GitLab. Um, I think we're less so uh, at the moment. However, um, I know that, for example, my colleague Pedro is actively engaged in, for example, designing the chat ops functionality with Metamost. And um, it's an area we, we should, or we are looking into it uh, more and more. There's a question about our user testing process and what does it look like and do we test with current GitLab users or do we find users who have no experience with GitLab and how do we find these users? Um, Sarah, I don't know if you want to talk a little, a little bit more to some of that. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, well, we're still in the process of kind of building our user testing. Um, so at the moment, we're, we're only in our very initial stages of doing testing with users. Um, if you answer the survey, there's the opportunity to sign up for, as a research participant for GitLab. So that's one way we've collected users. Um, and that will include users who are familiar with GitLab, um, but also those who don't use it. And so it will give us the option to test with both. Um, other ways you can kind of find users to test them is like through social media is a, a great option. Um, also through um, email, uh, blog posts, stuff like that. Um, to be honest, we're very lucky that we do have a kind of very vocal community. So there's always a lot of people out there that are willing to help us. And um, as per the presentation, it, it's more finding the quieter voices sometimes and ensuring that their voices are heard too. Um, cool. And uh, there's another question about our design process and just kind of how does it work and, and all. Um, and it, uh, there's a lot of kind of ways that, you know, our design process works. There's, um, us responding to issues that come up. Um, so if someone, you know, suggests either a problem they're having or a idea that they have, we start to kind of dig into that and understand why they're having that problem. So we might ask questions or we might, you know, explore it ourselves. Um, we also, as a team, will create, uh, when we have ideas, we'll, you know, uh, create, <laughs> As you see, a common theme is there's a lot with issues, so we'll create an issue ourselves, and we'll talk through, you know, what does it, you know, what the idea is trying to solve. Sometimes uh, it's very important for us to take a step back and start with the goal or the context of the area, especially when we're thinking of kind of, you know, um, more, you know, larger uh, uh, features. And so sometimes it's okay. Let's make sure we're all on the same page in terms of goals. And then we'll sit down and start to kind of explore, iterate, sketch, uh, post, um, you know, start to kind of create some, some mocks and, and talk through um, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense and, and flows. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, just a lot of conversations we have um, and a lot of back and forth. Um, being, you know, part of why we use uh, GitLab issues so uh, heavily, I mean, first of all, using our own project helps us understand it, but also because we're a distributed team, um, you know, we want everyone on the team to be a part of the conversation and everyone's working at different times for the time zones and everything. And so, you know, you put, you push an idea out there and you get people's feedback on it. Um, and so uh, we do, you know, we will have um, video calls and, and conversations and Slack and all where we do kind of have a real time back and forth, but we try to push and optimize for, you know, uh, having the asynchronous conversations and ideation uh, together. Um, so that's kind of a big part of our process. And and it's also just kind of uh, following the work as it comes um, from the initial kind of conception of it. You, you work on it, you ideate on it. And then, you know, the moment that there's, you know, a branch and, and some of it's been implemented, you know, we'll check it out ourselves and, you know, continue to kind of iterate and solve uh, problems or questions that come up at that point from a UX perspective. Um, so I don't know if there's like a clear answer of what our design process is, but that's some of what goes, uh, how it goes. Um, I see a follow-up question that tags into that. Uh, which is like what was the biggest issue, frustration of getting GitLab what it is today. Um, I think it taps into what our design process is like. And um, as Alison said, we make use of the conversational development in at GitLab, um, which may, tries to optimize for a synchronous conversation. And uh, basically the thing is you try to involve all the all important people uh, for an idea, uh, which is, is an issue is basically um, into the conversation as early as possible to, to see what kind of reach this idea has. And uh, part of this, this, this thing is, is uh, distilling an idea to its bare minimum as um, when you implement the bare minimum of an idea, it will be better the next 
after the, the next implementation of it. So if you've got implemented the idea and you, you use it actively, you can see, okay, now we have a clear way of what the next iteration of that idea should be instead of implementing it all at once. And, I mean, you can, you can develop an idea and it's, and this is sometimes a pain point. You want to do so much while well, keeping it to a bare essentials is the better way to go, as it will evolutionize into the right shape instead of what you assume to be the right space or uh, shape. Um, just a notice, um, it, I think we have a, a, a little more than nine minutes left for this, this uh, UX webcast. So um, we'll just get, get your last questions in if you have any. Um, there's one uh, that I just saw about what tools do we use to discuss to sorry, discuss UI sketches remotely. Um, this is also kind of uh, we're constantly evolving and learning um, how to do this. Um, I mean, a lot of it is just uh, you know we we still mostly use um, GitLab issues to discuss. And, you know, you can put sketches in there, you can put all kinds of comps in there and then talk about it. Um, some of it uh, can be a bit challenging to, um, you know, to give feedback, uh, to give the feedback, pointed feedback that you want on the sketches. So, you know, we're still evolving on, on how we can improve um, some of our remote kind of brainstorm capabilities. Uh, we do, you know, meet weekly, and that's sometimes when we need to just have a more kind of back and forth, let's talk through, you know, this big, hairy problem and kind of uh, find a focus or, or, or goal on that. Um, so, but there's, and, you know, you post stuff in Slack, but we don't, there's not any specific tool outside of GitLab, and, you know, we use, um, you know, we have our shared repository with sketch files, and so we can just kind of uh, use each other's sketch files and we'll get things. Um, but a lot of it's just, you know, posting images and issues and talking about it. Um, there are various questions on the tools we use and um, our design process. I think the design process has already been talked about. However, the design tools, um, I think, it has been mostly been clear, but we mostly use GitLab itself and the issue design discussion, or the, the issue discussion is the design discussion itself. Um, we post images in there. Um, as said previously, we'll make use of catch measure uh, as, as one of the things that we use to uh, give spec exports of our designs we made in Sketch to our developers in order for them to implement them. Um, and, and for example, we are looking into ways of enhancing the discussion itself to better fit our design discussion. Um, there are interesting examples of that, of, uh, for example, getting uh, better image functionality in there, um, amongst other things. Um, <laughs> I see that there's an, a question about image comments. Yes, we're actively looking into that. and. Um, just as an example of that, uh, on our summit, we have uh, we have had a great discussion on that, and uh, are uh, looking into ways and which way or um, which route we will take to implement uh, it to to be useful not only for ourselves but everyone that will use GitLab. And there's a question about how large our UX team is. Uh, so there are uh, five UX designers one UX researcher and then myself as a uh, team lead. Um, and, you know, we work very fluidly. Um, UX, uh, I mean, a designer might kind of be more involved with a feature for most of it if they can, you know, focus and, and spend the time on it. Um, but, you know, they can pull in uh, other people of the team as they need help or have questions or just need another pair of eyes. Um, a lot of features are are kind of since we ship monthly, a lot of things kind of uh, you know every month there's kind of a new iteration, new version, or new kind of thought in that area or on that feature. And so you know there are definitely kind of some general area areas that some of the designers focus on. 
but it's not anything strict or anything. There's a lot of kind of fluid movement. Everyone's kind of a part of the conversations and everyone can jump in, you know, with ideas and, and thoughts. Um, and so, yeah, there's, you know, some features, there might be a designer who's there the full time working through everything. Um, we try to make sure that there's clear understanding of who is the right person to reach out to if you have questions on, you know, as the de developer works on it, who they can work closely with. Um, but, you know, it constantly evolves as we need to evolve. Um, a question that, that is uh, a thing, actually, that came up um, apart from um, using Sketch is that we're looking into uh, using Framer for the more uh, advanced designs that actually need some, um, I, I forgot the word for it. <laughs> However, uh, for the advanced designs that need, uh, are needing motion or animation, et cetera. Um, there's also some optimization for this in the design repo itself, and uh, it can make uh, some design discussions very clear as motion is hard to explain in words only. Yeah, uh, definitely like when we're thinking about flows or prototypes or whatnot, wanting to kind of, you know, so, some times it's useful to move the design beyond uh, static images and to really figure out how something feels or what the motion, what that can add or, or detract from the experience and what are the subtle interactions that matter. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, we have a few more minutes. Let's see what questions come in. <laughs> do we, so a question came in, do we ever have to settle a UX argument and how or who is responsible for that? And what are the ultimate reasons to choose a design over another? Um, so I don't think there's been really heated <laughs> arguments. I think for the most part, we're able to talk things through. Um, a lot of it is if you bring it back down to the core uh, goals or context you're trying to solve, and then you can have a like, very analytical conversation of what you know, design works better for another, the pros and cons, and, and base that in as much as you can in terms of user uh, data or feedback that we have or our understanding of our users with personas to help us balance and, and, and make a decision. And so it, um, you know, is it, is one decision map better for our overall long-term goals or decisions or, or vision for GitLab? Um, what, you know, or what, you know, what makes things better for, enterprises versus, you know, all, you know, small teams and how we have to balance all that. So there's, there's a lot of conversation like that. And it's just kind of having, you know, as much as we can bring, you know, our understanding of our customers and users into our decision making, the better. Um, and so that's, that's it. I mean, there's a level like when it, you know, it comes down to it uh, as the UX, you know, <laughs> as UX team, and as you have seen, we we're responsible and it comes down to us to make the decision. Um, but it's usually, you know, very much a, a uh, <laughs> kind of just analytical think through what works, what doesn't work, and how can you decide what, what makes one design uh, make more sense than another. So. I think we're just about at time. Um, but I want to thank everyone so much for taking the time to um, join us in this webcast today and for all the awesome, wonderful questions. Super helpful, um, super great conversation. Um, let's see, uh, one, more <laughs> one more question just kind of slipped in under, under, under the wire about any tips for leading the UX team. Um, uh, Yeah, overall, it's just, uh, I mean, it's been so helpful that I, it's just been such a great team. <laughs> so it's been easy. Um, <laughs> uh, but just also making sure Thank that you. there's, you know, <laughs> um, a clear kind of shared uh, vision or direction as a team. And so part of what I've been trying to do is really, you know, when decisions are made uh, by the team, um, to document what I can in the UX guide to kind of weigh in and, and make sure we all understand what our, our, you know, 
goals is or pr our principles are as a team. So if everyone has the same base that they're coming from, then they're all able to, to everyone's able to kind of work as a team, even if we, you know, are all working at different times in different places around the globe, we have that sh same shared um, direction uh, that we're pushing towards. And so that's kind of, you know, making sure we all come from the same uh, base. But anyway, I think we do have to um, call it. So thank you everyone uh, for, uh, for taking the time to join us today and uh, for asking all the great questions.